I kind of want to, I'm going to read the scripture and then I will go back into it. I'll, I'll, I'll dive into what I'm talking about. It's going to be Matthew, I mean Mark 2 verses 1 through 5. And it won't be on the screen because I didn't give it to him. So, the scriptures say, a few days later when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging, it, digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to get up and take your mat and walk? But I want to sh you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you what, get up, take your mat, and go home. He didn't say walk. He said go home. Notice that. What happened? He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone. They praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Look at your name and say, we have never. Say it loud. We have never, we have never. seen anything like this. Um, thank you, Lord, for what you're going to say this morning. I just pray that you speak through me. I love you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. Mr. Soundman, if you can turn the auxiliary one down on this mic a little bit, it'll um, stop that feedback thing. Check. There we go. Um, so I um, spent some time yesterday walking with Terrence Lester, and we talked about who Terrence Lester is before and what he's doing. As of right now, he is probably walking, headed towards um, Spartanburg. And um, God's really doing some amazing things in his movement. And as I began to really think through and process what we were doing, a couple of things happened. First of all, I started remembering kind of where I grew up and what I've experienced in my life as far as poverty and things like that. Um, I always had to, my mom was a single mom raising three boys and she clawed and clawed and fought and fought to make sure we were okay. And a lot of that time we, we experienced some pretty tough times financially and different things like that and so I think we've all been affected in some way some form some fashion by poverty when we all know what it feels like to be the underdog and down and out what's that song down and out luck whatever that's I don't know how it goes you know it's an old school song but anyways we've all had the the opportunity to walk through some tough trials and stuff like that and and some of us are still, we still face things nowadays, but we have our Savior and we know that there's a better day coming. And, um, but when you face things alone, it's a tough, tough, tough place to be in. Amen? Um, it, it's, it's really 
I mean, let's think about it. If, you, if you're going through something and you're really dealing with struggles and issues and pain and hurt and all this kind of stuff, to deal with that kind of stuff with no love and no help and no friends is a tough situation. Amen? And um, as I was thinking about it yesterday, we were walking down Way Hampton, and we walked 12.6 miles, I think it was, and, I, you know, I felt every bit of that 12.6 when it was all said and done. I was like, oh, God, Jesus. I, was, I kept telling them I was doing that pre-shout, pre-shout walk, you know, when you walk like that, you're like, hey. Um, and I, just, I was just walking like that just the whole time. But uh, um, <laughs> um, the, the reality is God will send you people in your life um, who will be there for a lifetime. He'll send you people in your life who will be there for seasons. Amen? The struggle comes in is when we have to learn how to discern how long people are supposed to be in our life. Because sometimes we let seasonal people stay too long. And then we get mad at them when they have over, over, you know, overstayed their welcome. And it's not their fault. It's not their issue. They're just trying to be a friend to you. And they were called to be a friend to you in a certain season. And, and when that time is up, most of those people don't know that that season's up. They just keep trying to be your friend. And you got to learn how to know when that season's up. So you can look at people and not in the loving, uh, not in a mean way, but just say, you know, hey, man, God, I I know, because you know when that season's up. You and I both know when your seasonal friends need to move on. Uh Amen? Amen? When you get them phone calls, you look at your phone, you go, oh. Oh, God, you know. And it lasts like that for a couple of months, you know. Oh, Jesus. You got to learn how to let seasonal people go. But sometimes we have lifetime people who we treat as seasonal. And then the people that are supposed to stick with you and walk with you. But the moment they start doing stuff you don't like, you like, "Uh uh-uh, you got to go. I've learned as a pastor, there are people that God's called to me for a season, and there are people that God's called to me for a lifetime. Amen? And here's the kicker for ministers and for pastors and and things like that. You have to learn how when those people are not a part of your church, you still got to know if they were seasonal or lifetime. Hello? Hello? Because, see, you can have a lifetime person who will help you with your ministry for a season. Look at your name and say amen. Amen. And sometimes we get mad at people who are are lifetime that the moment they leave our ministry or they stop helping us with our dream, we ain't cool no more. That ain't friendship. That's called a business partnership. But we got to learn how to discern seasonal people and lifers. Amen? Because seasonal people are there for one reason only, to help you through the season that you're in. And the way you can discern it's to judge what season you're in. Yeah. All right? I'm, I've been in financial struggle. I'm rebuilding these finances. And God sent this person who's really good at budgeting. And they're really good. They're a financial advisor. And they want to be my friend. They want to help me. And they want to help me. And they want to help me. And that's great. But they don't want to hang out with me. And that's fine, too. I've learned, me, let me let you operate in your gift in this season that I'm in. 
Amen? Amen. And when that season is up, I have to be bold enough to go to the person and say, I love you. We're friends. I'm not struggling financially anymore. And I would love for you to stick around and we can be friends. But I don't really need all that financial advice anymore. <laughs> can we work that out? Hello. I've learned in my own life with church planning, there are people who are seasonal and there are people who are lifers. Amen. 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 You will learn very quickly. There are people who will show up when your season is good. And then there are people who will leave when the season gets bad. And it's okay. Because that's what they're supposed to do. They're seasonal. They're like the little limb way on the outside of the branch. So you begin to learn and decipher people who are seasons and who are lifers. Now your lifers are people who are not there for any particular reason. They're just there. Amen? They're people who will walk you through trials and tribulations and storms and be there and laugh with you and cry with you and, and hug on you and, 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 and get mad at you and you get mad at them and then y'all all right again the next day and then you cracking jokes on each other and then, you, then you're mad. You know, me and Lamar, we, we don't do that. You know, like, you, you mad, cuss each other out. We ain't cuss each other out. He probably cussed me out of his head all the time, but we ain't going to talk about that because uh, I don't cuss in my head. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Look, he moving. He moving. <laughs> uh, and there are people who will walk with you through times and tribulations and, tri and trials and all kinds of stuff. And you, and you got to learn how to decipher those people in your life. And, and listen, you ain't going to get 15 of those. You, oh, this is my best friend. Mm-hmm. For how long? Uh, and you got like 25 best friends. How are you working that out? That's like married, being married to two different women. I just, I can't imagine. No, no. One is enough. Look at your name and say, one is enough. But sometimes you will have friends in your life that are lifers. And they're there. I look at me and Quentin. Quentin, it's my homie. We've been friends for, we've been down like four flat tires. <laughs> Quentin knew me in my dancing days yeah. when I was on the pole. Just kidding. <laughs> it was a step team pole. It was a broom, okay? It was a step team pole. We built a, 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 a pulsating pyramid. It was terrible. But we won that comp. Well, actually, we got disqualified. Look at that. Didn't we? Mm hmm. Lifer, though, but he's a lifer. If Quentin left the church today, please don't leave the church. I would still love on him and I would still be his friend because we have that kind of connection. Quentin can pick up the phone and call me and be like, What you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm good, man. No, how you doing? I'm good. No, how you doing? You know, I, you asked like four times, and then I go, you know, man, I just got a lot on my mind. You know, I, I thought so. Let me call you back later. <laughs> you got to learn how to decipher lifers and seasonal people. Amen? There are people who are with you forever. The people who you just meet and you know y'all supposed to, me and, when me and Rio met, I was like, it's my homie. This dude's a trip. I get on his nerves, he get on my nerves. <laughs> All the time. That's the beauty of church planting. But 
I've discerned my lifers and my seasonal people. And so, as I began to think about this today, I was thinking, you know, there are a lot of people who live in the street who are struggling, who are going through tough times, who are we're surrounded by poverty and by all this stuff that's happening in our nation right now. And I am curious to know how many people have friends that stick with them through it all. Because you, you got those people that are there. They are there when you are, you are successful. And the moment... You fail, they scatter. They leave, and you, go, and you left there to pick up all the pieces by yourself. And you're left there to try and put things back in order. And you're left there trying to figure things out yourself. But, but you need people around you who will, they, listen, some of them folk are so, like, like I, listen, I love Ter- Terrence Lessons, my homie. But I was telling Brandy them yesterday, I said, you know, sometimes when I'm around him, I feel like I done did something wrong. <laughs> and it's not because I did something wrong or he's a certain way. He just, he's just, he quiet. And he's like looking at you and he's peering into your soul. And I'm like wanting to laugh about something. He's like. <laughs> I'm like, bro, can I get a smile? You know? But I know at the end of the day, if something happened to me, I could call him and be like, hey, man, can you, can you help my family out? I know that when he's walking, he's not just walking for people. He's walking for people like me who live with the fear that all of it could fall to pieces at, all to, at any time. I know if my life fell apart right now that I have people like that that will help me put the pieces back together, that will cry with me, that will laugh with me, that will come from around the country to to just be there and say, man, you can can overcome, you can work through these things. And you need people in your life like that. And if you don't have people like that, you need to work really hard to get people around you like that because those are the people that when you are paralyzed, when you are in your bed, when you have your mat and you're laying down, you can't move and you can't walk, those are the people who will dig a hole to get you to Christ. Those are the people that will do whatever it takes to press through so you can get your breakthrough. Those are the people. Those are the people. Now, we look into this story here. A lot of preachers like to focus on the four crazy friends. And now, I'm going to say something, and I want you to just take it. You need about four people in your life that will fight for you. Now, why did I say four? If this had been three, somebody would have been struggling trying to help this man out. Just think about the mat. Four of them even the weight out. So when they carried him, they all had a certain amount of weight that they were bearing for this man. Okay, so I'm saying to you, maybe strive to get you four people around you that when you are in your tough season, they know they can help you balance the weight. Amen? So they are crazy. They come up, Jesus back in town, people hear about it, and they all happy. Jesus says, meet me down yonder at Red Sea Baptist Church. <laughs> this is not actually in the Bible, people, okay? I'm just I'm telling you how I see the story. And they got signs over, all over the town. They got a picture of Jesus' feet with them sandals on. The man who's been walking has came back. And Jesus is in town, and meet me at Red Sea Baptist Church. And he gets there, and there are all these people there. 
and it's so packed, they fill up the house, and then they standing around the house. They got the windows open, the praise band, and they're going, mm, Jesus, you're here. Jesus, he's right there. You know, and, and uh, <laughs> Jesus is like, all right, guys, it's time for me to preach. Jesus gets up there and he says, listen, people, I came to you today to tell you. And the crowd's out there going, aye, yeah. And then you got these men walking up holding this man. And Jesus is like, it's time to heal somebody. And they're going crazy. I'm sorry, that's not a slime bubble. Anyway, they walk up, and there's a crowd, and there, there's people everywhere. Yeah. And these friends, instead of looking at the crowd going, ah, man, we ain't gonna, it ain't going to work out for you today. I'm so sorry. We tried, though. We tried. They didn't look at that. They looked at the crowd. They assessed the crowd, and they said, we got to find another way. Now, listen, you need people in your life that won't let the circumstance stop them from helping you. Because see, you know, you got them people in your life that their circumstances, they look at their own finances and they, they know they can help you. They can probably help you, but if they help you, then they might not be able to get dinner out later on this week, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And, and so you got to have people around you that will say, no matter what it takes, no matter what I need to do, what I, whatever it is you need, I'm going to make sure that you're taken care of because I want to make sure that you have what you need because I know God has called me to your life forever. And so these men looking, they go, wow, this crowd is crazy. And I can just kind of hear the conversation. And I imagine if I was in the conversation, I'd be looking like, hey, guys, what are we going to do? Tell me what we're going to do. What we gonna do? And they like, ah oh, man. I you know, and we human. If I'm standing there, I might be looking, hey bro, we we trying. I'm gonna need you to chill out. And you can you just imagine this guy on the mat, he probably cried, No, oh, I need to see Jesus. Give me the Jesus, please. And and all this stuff going, and they're looking at the crowd, and they're going, what are we going to do? And, and instead of turning around and going home, somebody has a crazy idea. Somebody says, hey, let's go up on the roof and get this man to Jesus. Now, you have to indulge me for a moment as to how this conversation may have went down. Jesus preaching, people screaming, crowds everywhere, and then one guy says, hey, I got an idea. And everybody's like, what's up? Let's carry this man on the roof. Hold on, hold on. Did you bring your ladder? How are we going to get him up on the roof? See, we read the story like it happened in a few minutes. Mm -mm. They had to put some work in. Let's carry him on the roof. Can you imagine being in that conversation? Bruh, we are holding a man on a mat. Did you bring a ladder? I don't see no ladder around here. You must be crazy. You see all these people? How does it go happen? Blah, blah, blah. And I can just imagine going up and down, up and down, up and down. And, and then finally somebody's like, all right, let's do it. All right, bro, let's do it. Now, we might drop you. Just be ready. But, so these men make their way to wherever they're going to climb up on top of the house so they can drop the man down through the roof. This is not a two-minute story that you see on paper. This is some work. 
And you got to have friends around you that will put in work, that will stick with you, that will hang with you, that will lift you up no matter how much it hurts. And these people were working to get this man in front of Jesus. And we need people in our life who will do that, who will put in work for us, who will put their faith on the line, who will put everything on the line so they will say, listen, I need you to know that I care for you, man, and I'm going to do whatever it takes if I got to lift you up on top of a roof, even though you heavy. Come on, somebody. So they put in some work. They get the man up on the roof. And now I can only imagine how tiring it must have been for them to get him on the roof. And then when they get him on the roof, the Bible says the next thing that happens is they start digging. Now, if you knew how houses were made back in the day, was it a little, little, you know, you didn't just hit it with a hammer and all the stuff? No, it was, they, they had to dig straw, hay, whatever it may have been, dirt, all the stuff. They had to get dirty. They had to get dirty. They had to get dirty. They got their hands dirty. They got their legs dirty. They got their clothes dirty, everything. <clears throat> See, I know we look at this with like a little text on a piece of paper, but it's not, it wasn't like that. They got dirty. They got dirt under their fingernails. They, you know, they just moving stuff out of the way. And they didn't just dig a small hole. They had to dig a big enough hole to lower the whole mat through it. And if you can only picture that this man may have been 6'1 or something, this mat had to be long, whatever it may be. I don't know how, how tall he was, but I know he wasn't no little two, uh, three-inch circle. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> and if he was a grown man, he had to be at least five feet, at least. And so they had to dig. Now, here's a couple of things I want you to think about. They're digging. Jesus is preaching. When they lower him down, they lower him down in front of Jesus. Now, me being a preacher, I would be like, what is going on up above my head right now? Jesus kept on going. The crowd was still there. And they were so passionate about their friend being healed that they will interrupt Jesus in the middle of speaking. Do you have friends in your life who will interrupt Jesus on your behalf? I'm going to say it again because y'all are so quiet right there. Do you have friends in your life who will stop everything, do whatever is going on, and interrupt Jesus on your behalf? See, you need people who don't care what they've got going on in their life. They'll stop what they need to stop to make sure you're all right. Here's the other thing. You need to be the kind of person who is a friend to someone that in the middle of your trials, you will interrupt heaven on behalf of your friend. You will show up and say, listen, I'm going through, but I need you, the Lord, to help my homegirl. Help out my homeboy. They're struggling. They're going through. They need you, Father. Do you have people in your life who will interrupt heaven on your behalf? And so... These men, after have working really hard to get on the roof, they have to work hard to get the man through the roof. And they dig and they dig and they dig and they dig. And then they finally drop him down. And the Bible says that Jesus looks at the guys and looks up at the friends. And he says, 
He sees their faith. Now, here's something to think about. I don't know if the man was faithless or if he was just tired. But somewhere in there, he didn't believe it was going to happen. And Jesus saw him and didn't heal him. He saw his friends and healed them. Do you have people around you that when you stop believing, that God will see their faith and still work it out on your behalf? See, you need the kind of people that have enough faith that it overrides your lack of faith. Amen? Look at somebody say, hack the system. You need people who will hack the system on your behalf. When your faith is gone, when you've done all you can and you're tired and you say, I just can't believe you no more and I don't think it's going to happen, there are people around you that say, nope, I'm not giving up. I still believe that God is a restorer of faith. I still believe that God can heal. I still believe that God can mend the broken. I still believe that God can bring grace to a situation. I still believe that God can can, uh, fix broken hearts. I still believe that God will do what he said he would do in your life. And I believe that even today, no matter what it looks like, I still believe that God is able to do some great things in your life. And you need people in your life who who will say, I still believe. And even when you respond to them with, I don't believe. Who will hear you talk all your junk? Who will hear you say all the bad and negative stuff that you can think of and still believe on your behalf? Amen? So they dug, and Jesus looked in and he saw their faith, and then he told the man, Hey, son, your sins are forgiven. And then it ensues, and it says that the man, he said to the man, Hey, get up, take up your mat, and go home, and all this stuff. But here's what I want to point out, because we can talk about the four crazy friends, and we can preach a whole message on that, and we can talk about the crowd and how everybody in that room had the opportunity to get a healing, but only one person, with the help of friends, somehow his story was recorded as a miracle. Just think about that. Or we could talk about the owner of the house and how he could have been mad about a roof, a hole being torn in his roof. Amen? You ever had miracles happening in your house that left um, a little bit of a dent on your, you're like, what? What just happened? <laughs> what? How you, t- you know? There's a hole in the wall out there. It's not my fault. I'm just going to go and throw that out. <laughs> we could talk about that man. We could talk about uh, the town and in which the crowd was there and how we don't really hear any more stories about what happened in that crowd, in that town. We could talk about all that stuff. We could talk about Jesus. We could talk about Jesus being tired but still healing people. We could talk about Jesus putting in work. We could talk about Jesus not being mad about being interrupted while speaking. We could talk about all kinds of stuff, and and, and what we're not. But what we are going to talk, what I want to point out to you is this. And here's the, here's the truth, and here's what I really want you to take from this. There's a man in the story who is paralyzed. Okay? He's paralyzed. He's having to rely on others for his miracle. I don't know how long he's been paralyzed. I know he's been paralyzed long enough to not believe that he can be healed. 
no matter what's happening around him, no matter how crazy these four people are, it's still, when, even when he's lowered in front of Jesus, he's so worn out that he still don't believe. Even though his friends worked hard and they did whatever they could to help him and make sure he was taken care of, he still don't believe. And I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by him because it takes a vulnerable, a, a, a person of vulnerability to allow somebody to carry them around. Amen? And see, I think the toughness is that we don't know how to decipher friends because we don't know how to be vulnerable. We don't know how to let people in. We don't know how to, uh, 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 to be real with people. There's some people in your life who really want to know what's going on with you, who really want to pray for you, who really want to be around you, but you so closed off and you so walled up that you can't even let people in. And we do it because we act like we still have faith when we don't have faith. We got counterfeit faith, and we, we know that we're struggling, we're having a hard time, but we won't surround ourselves with people who will help us out. And we won't let ourselves be around people who will believe that we can still see a greater day even when we don't believe it ourselves. And the, 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 the thing I'm most intrigued about in this story is not so much the crazy friends that are around him, but I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by the faithless man who was being carried by others. Because see, sometimes in life you can be so broken. You can be so broken that you stop believing. And we all approach those kind of moments. But we're so broken and brokenhearted and, 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 and hurt and disappointed and, and living defeated and all this stuff that we are so broken that we stop believing for a greater day. We stop dreaming. We stop hoping. And what I'm saying is, even if you get to that point, be vulnerable enough to let friends help you. I'm not telling you, don't get to a point where you're so tired. I'm not telling you, keep believing, God's going to do something great. I'm not telling you, I don't want to, I listen. Lay aside all the churchy words and all that stuff for a moment. Listen, you're hurt, you're broken, you're tired. I've been there. I have been, I listen, right, even right now, I'm like, oh, Lord, you got to help me. It's okay if you're at that point. It's okay if that's where you are. Watch it online. If it's okay if it's okay. If you're going through trials and tribulations and struggles right now, it's okay if you're at the point of no hope. It's okay if you're at the point of disbelief. It is okay. But I'm asking you and I'm begging you to surround yourself with people who will help you out of the pit when you don't believe. <coughs> you need people around you who won't stop believing. And on the flip side, you need to be a person who will believe for others when they don't believe. See, this is the call of the gospel. This is the call of the church. He said, go and make disciples of the nations. Teaching and preaching, showing them the way. Demonstration. Demonstration. We heard this last Sunday night. Go and demonstrate. 
See, we, we want to put our voice out there and we want to put our facade on and we want to act like we got it all together. And, and that's, you don't. I don't. Don't none of us glow in the dark. None of us. Unless you got glow in the dark fingernail paint or toenail paint, whatever it is you put on paint. You dipping your feet in that glow stick liquid. Come on, somebody. But don't none of us glow in the dark. But for some reason, most of us act like we do. I'm saying to you, be vulnerable enough to allow friends to surround you and pray for you. Stop trying to do life alone. Leverage your connections. Leverage the community that you're in so that you can see greater things happen in your life. You're not going to get anywhere by yourself. Great things don't just happen without help. The most successful people in your life, in life, will tell you it did not happen without the help of a team. Well, I got these dreams, Fred. Well, get people around you who will help you. I got stuff that I really want to do with my life. Nobody knows. Because it's all in your head. Right, division making plans so that the person will see it and run with it. The key to it is writing it. But if it's up here, we're not mind readers. When nobody loves me, my church don't support me. We don't know what you want to do. <laughs> I want to do you, you ain't telling us nothing. How are we supposed to figure it out? Ah, I got a headache, y'all. I'm working through it. I'm working through it. I'm saying to you, surround yourself with people who will keep believing when you stop believing. I think it is under, it's crazy because it says since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof by digging above, they, above Jesus. They were digging above Jesus. They interrupted heaven's son. Enough for this man that he was going to heal him. And because they wanted it enough, because they kept believing, even when he couldn't believe, even when he couldn't walk, they walked for him. See, you, you see, do you see what's happening here? There are people doing stuff for him that he can't do for himself. He can't walk, so they're walking for him. He can't, he can't climb, so they're climbing for him. He can't dig, so they're digging for him. He, they, he, he don't have the strength to lower himself, so they're lowering him for him. And then when he gets down there, he ain't believing nothing, so they believe for him. And Jesus sees all of this and he says, I'm going to heal you. Not because of what you uh, are incapable of. Not because you can't believe. Not because of anything that you're doing. I'm going to do it because your friends are doing all the work for you. Because you got people around you who still believe that I'm able. Who, have, who still believe that I can do something great in your life. Even though you have lost your faith. Even though you ain't even quite here. Even though you can't function like a normal person. I'm still going to do it because there are people who are around you who believe for you. That makes me think, don't stop praying for your loved ones, for your family, the ones that are lost. I know it gets tiring praying for somebody who keeps doing the same old thing, keep making the same old mistakes. I'm encouraging you to keep praying for them because one day God's going to see your faith and he's going to heal their heart. 
One day you're going to see the fruit of the labor of all the time that you spend on your knees crying out before a father, asking him to save your child and to save whatever or whoever, your cousin, whoever it is. You're going to see the fruit of that labor one day because they're going to stand before a king who's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And it's now you may enter into your promise. You, listen, you're going to see the fruit of your labor of praying for people. And don't stop believing for other people because one day you're going to see the fruit of your labor. And I know it gets on your nerves that they keep making the same dumb decision, decisions over and over and over. I love my little brother, but I'm telling you, I'll be like, bro, what is your problem, son? But I ain't stopped praying for him. I'm still believing for him because I know when it's all said and done, he's going to have a testimony that's going to shake nations, that's going to change the world. And if I, do, if I stop believing for him, guess what? He won't believe for himself and nobody will believe for him. But you got to keep on fighting for others with your faith. But on the flip side, be vulnerable enough to let somebody fight for you. Because let's just be honest. Let's keep it 100. We ain't always wanting to believe. And sometimes you felt enough pain to give up. And it's hard work to try and act like you got it together when you don't. hard work. And God is not interested in you acting like you got it together. God is interested in you telling him the truth. Saying, Lord, I'm struggling. I keep trying to get past this, but somehow I keep coming back to it. I keep falling in the same old pit. I keep messing up, and I need you. See, that kind of truth is difficult to do. It's difficult to be naked and unashamed. Because we all want to act like we got this facade. But you can't do that. The most difficult thing for me in the world was when when I I confessed to my wife my struggle with pornography, I remember that. It was tough. It was tough. Because I thought she going to leave me for sure. It's over with. But she didn't. She was bad. Listen, that white girl would get feisty, boy. Together. Up in the hill. She wasn't happy about it. And she said, I still believe in a better day for you. And you know what she did? She started praying for me. I remember I woke up one night in the middle of the night and she was just looking over me. I'm like, what is going on? She said, I'm praying for you. And to this day, she does it. She probably did it last night because I fell asleep so early. I'm praying for you. I'm still believing for you. She prays for protection over me. She prays that God guard my mind. Angels stand watching. 
that I don't fall back into my old sinful ways. And you need people around you like that. And I want to encourage you today to find you some friends. Find you some friends that'll make you say, I ain't never seen nothing like this. I ain't never seen nothing like this. I ain't never had a friend like this. Never in my life. I think to myself, when I get old, who do I want sitting on my porch in my rocking chairs next to me? Think about that. I want my old farmhouse with a bunch of land, and I want to be able to sit on my porch, and I want to rock. And who do I want sitting around me? Who do I want to be there that we just talk about stuff? Remember that old time? Drive down the road and live that time busted. <laughs> Me and Lamar are going to be some old, funny men. Funny, funny old men. I'm like, boy, your head been bald since you were 13. <laughs> he going to go, your space was there when you teach when you were first born. You came out your mama's womb with a mouth full of teeth. Think about that this week. When you were in your 70s, 80s, you retired and you watched your kids grow up and you're rooting the next generation on because you passed the ball. Who do you want sitting on your porch with you? Those are your lifers. Those are your lifers. Amen.